Welcome to the Santa Cruz Coffee Break. If you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts, please follow, hit the like button, or any subscribes. It really helps us with the algorithms. Santa Cruz Coffee Break is independent of Santa Cruz Guitar Company, and all opinions are those of the speakers. Santa Cruz Coffee Break is produced by the Santa Cruz Guitar Players Forum. We invite you to join us on the Santa Cruz Guitar Players Forum at SCGCPF for more fun. Now, let's get on with this installment of Santa Cruz Coffee Break. And we'll say, first of all, folks, we'd like to welcome you all to podcast number 16 of the Santa Cruz Guitar Players Forum. 16, can you believe it? Sweet 16. And for Sweet 16, we have a special treat of Eric Sky. And I'm going to read Eric's bio here, often billed as an acoustic jazz guitarist. Eric's actually occupies a unique niche between traditional acoustic music Model, model jazz, modal jazz, sorry, folk and blues, with a technical approach that is somewhat informed by studying classical guitar reluctantly in middle school, being obsessed with Jimmy Page, bluesy jazz guitarists like Kenny Burrell and Grant Green, as well as being exposed to the California style of solo guitar playing from Wyndham Hill label that was happening around him as a young person in the Bay Area. Lately, Eric has uh, moved to Portland, Oregon, and um, it's quite an honor for me to say that I met Eric at a house concert about 10 years ago, and as soon as he was done playing, I immediately went up to him and said, I think we should record something of you. So we, we had an eight-year run. We just looked at a calendar yesterday, and uh, we, didn't, we, haven't, uh, we were working two years ago yesterday. And that was the last time Eric kind of went off on his own and he's uh, making his own videos now, doing an amazing job with it. Thank so um, welcome, Eric Sky. Thank you for having me, guys. It's great seeing you again, Eric. I was going to say that I think it's been about 10 years. I, I sent you an email after hearing about one of your house concerts saying, hey, guy, how can uh, we have a house concert? And you send an email back and... Uh, I forget if it was you alone or you with Tim Connell. I don't um, know. I don't know. I've, I've, I think we've done this in a couple different uh, incarnations there. But yeah, have guitar, we'll travel. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I just, I just remember one of them was very special because it was the, the, the day that you picked up your uh, signature model. Uh, oh, that's Santa Cruz. Yeah, that's right. That I think that was with Tim Connell. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. That's right. I picked up the guitar and then drove down to Berkeley and did a house concert. That's right. That's with right. a new guitar. Yeah, and most of the evening you were you were staring at the guitar. Were, <laughs> well, you, well, you were you were both you were both overwhelmed with it and <laughs> and kind of falling in love with it at the same time. Yeah. It was. Uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I, I I totally forgot about that. But that yeah, I remember that now. We uh, um, we're blessed with a current project from you, Eric, of fiddle tunes. Right. And for those that know you as a jazz guitar player, fiddle tunes. I've known that you've always been a, always been been a real big part of them and things like that. But it's an amazing project. You want to talk about it a little bit? Okay. Sure. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, you know, I've been interested in this music for a really long time. I started playing, uh, we'll say traditional music, flat picking music, probably 25 years ago or so. And then maybe it was, I think it was five years ago that Tim Connell and I made the June Apple record, which is kind of the first time I've done that in a kind of a professional way, right? Um, yeah, I, I love that music. I got interested in it, um, you know, in the late 90s when I was living in San Francisco someone um, asked me to to play Blackberry Blossom, I think it was, and I didn't know the tune. So I went and researched <laughs> it. And I, you know, I just, I just, I really got into it, you know, and, um, and it's, pro it's definitely the musically, it's the biggest part of my life. I mean, I, I haven't played much finger style or anything at all <laughs> recently, or any kind of jazz thing. So, um, you know, to me, it's not that big of a a deal. I mean, I, I in terms of like jazz versus traditional music or whatever. I mean, it's it's all music making to me. I I've often tried to mince words and say that I consider myself, you know, an acoustic guitar player who was 
playing jazz or or playing this or playing that rather than a jazz guitar player playing acoustic i'm i'm not comfortable in the you know in the jazz world or with the jazz label either necessarily so so it wasn't a big you know leap for me they're tunes and they're, they're tunes that i love i think in both cases there's this real emphasis on melody um i love melody and uh i really identify with these melodies and i like to pull on melodies like taffy and and make them my own and um so you know it's just there's only 12 notes you know <laughs> i mean so there's a lot and there's a lot in common there's just sort of different grooves and tonalities and stuff but yeah I, i'm 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 really loving kind of digging deep into into this music and the 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 fiddle tunes thing that you're referring to is that i just I think, um, you know, during this sort of worldwide pause, you know, I decided I would kind of bear down on that a little bit more and and uh, also been kind of putting a lot of emphasis into doing my own production more, you know, um, audio, videos, you know, and, and stuff. So anyway, I just thought it'd be fun to put up. I think I was going to do a month's worth, but I kind of ran out of gas. It's kind of a lot of work, you know, on the on the production side. It's not a lot of work to sit and play fiddle tunes, but um, yeah, it. it it was it was a lot of fun and so those just went up on um you know on the facebook and 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 the instagram and and whatnot you you use youtube to host those right i didn't no you, you hosted yeah. them on facebook really yeah yeah because I, I like the idea that they're just kind of out there for a little while and they disappear into the ether it, you know it's kind of like touring you know <laughs> you just <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I mean, I may do something like that on YouTube. I don't know. To me, YouTube is is a little more of record. You know, it's sort of there for good and sort of evergreen. And and they were just sort of little short, uh, you know, vignettes of of, of tunes. Uh, I mean, there's some longer form expression of 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 that side of what I do uh, up there, especially stuff that I put up last year with Jamie Stillway. Yeah, that you know, it, it 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 amazes me when you just said that you aren't playing that much. Um, you weren't haven't been playing that much jazz, and then now to move into this kind of COVID thing that we that we're all kind of going through and things like that. Um, the fiddle tunes makes it makes sense. You know, the, there's a couple of things I really identify with them. One, I, I've often thought that the music just in general sounds very hopeful. Um, and I think that, you know, from from the most of the ones that I like are, are older tunes, you know, and, um, you know, I, I like to say like when Lewis and Clark <laughs> came <laughs> across the country for the first time, you know, they brought like gunpowder, <laughs> whiskey, and they brought a fiddler, you know, um it's just it's just been an important part of you know the story for for a long time and um they're again they're, they're they can be very you know bluesy in the in the verb sense you know i mean they're 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 emotive and and whatnot but overall a lot of especially the major key ones just sound it just sounds very hopeful so yeah that seemed like something to kind of dig into um during this time you know yeah, no, it, it definitely, it definitely, they're uplifting and, and encouraging in, in a way that we really need, I think, at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and again, like, I, I, to me, there's just a ton to, um, to hang my hat on, you know, I mean, it, it's like, there's a lot to work with there. Um, I find it probably more challenging than playing jazz music. I think a lot of times in jazz music, you're trying to find some notes that work over a lot of chords. Now I'm trying to find a lot of notes that work over a few chords, but it's the same, it's that same thing. I mean, you're still having this little journey through harmony and variation of melody. And if anything, I feel like there's, there's more um, sort of precedent and responsibility towards staying in the melody, staying, making variations of the melody in that music. Whereas jazz is kind of, um, not to poo poo it or whatever, but like later and late, you know, like after like the, the 50s and 60s and 70s, there's so much emphasis on virtuosity in jazz that, you know, the average person, they go to a jazz club, like, yeah, okay, whatever. You know, it's just, it's hard to, it's hard to know where to dig in, where, where, what's the access point? How do you get in this lake? You know, like, um, it, it, 
it, because it's just, just so much like play the melody and then the melody is stated and then just jump in. And now for the next five minutes, it's about how amazing I am at playing my instrument. And uh, I'm playing a whole bunch of notes that work over this chord uh, and then this chord and then this chord. But, um, you know, I really love looking back on sort of Louis Armstrong and stuff where he would, uh, you know, he, if he played Summertime, like all the way through, if you picked up the needle and put it anywhere <laughs> on that record, it was still Summertime. You know, it was still in there, the big notes of the melody, the themes, the contours and all of that. So much more of a theme and variation approach to uh, improvisation, uh, or maybe not, maybe, do, I don't even like using the word improvisation, it's just themes and variations. Um, anyway, in this music, particularly, um, if, for me, like I'm, I'm kind of going past like the guitar stuff so much and kind of going and listening to a lot of just actual fiddle players and more traditional fiddle music. Um, you know, there's much more emphasis on hug, staying close to the melody um, or, you know, or the solo becomes a slow journey from the melody. You know, you're just slowly deconstructing it and then maybe reconstructing your way back. I find that that's um, a very challenging thing to do um, over the long form, you know what I mean? Over a couple minutes, maybe you're gonna play, uh, you know, five choruses <laughs> and each one's gonna get a little bit different. That's a lot harder than just like, you know, playing some cool guitar licks that kind of in a modular sense, like here comes this chord, I'm gonna drop this thing that works. Here comes this chord, I'm gonna drop this thing that works. This is requiring a, a longer thread uh, of awareness of, of what's happening, um, you know, in the, the melody and the harmony. Does that all make sense? <laughs> Should I slow down on the coffee? <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, it makes complete sense because you really are looking inside the tune to see kind of what you can bring to it, but yet maintaining the respect yeah. of the of the past you know and 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 those that have played that song before you you know it it and it sounds more like it's kind of more joyous yeah yeah and 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 you know another way to think of it is like i love history in general and i i love old art and i love the fact that these are old tunes but they're not it's not classical <laughs> you know it kind of in some ways it kind of comes up to that line in some ways you know i think of some of these tunes they go back to the late 1780s 1790s you know so they they're kind of right there in terms of of the era but but this was you know for from the folks and for the folks you know it wasn't for the king and queen or whatever you know and um you know and i like the fact that there's this there's there's so much room for self-expression People say there's a lot of room for self-expression for classical music, but not enough for me. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's a squeaker, right? You know, I like the ability of, of, I like the ability to, you know, kind of get some of me in there. And yet, you know, these tunes are so old that I think, you know, unless you're just, you know, stupid, <laughs> you, know, you, you have to have that reverence for them. And it's so great to play a piece of music that some, well, I want to say somebody, maybe it was somebody or a group of people, or this tune has been kind of traveling through all of us for hundreds of years. And that's, that's amazing. Um, so I, I get, I get a lot of satisfaction out of that. And I do with the old jazz tunes also, but this is, you know, this is sort of older still. Um, and uh, I like that. They may be old tunes, but I think what's really uh, kind of magical about it is somebody who may have known the tune a hundred years ago would still recognize it. But I wanted to drop back a little bit. You said, you know, there's only 12 notes and, and you're right that technically that's true. But what was amazing about your um, jazz and blues work and, and I heard this comment before and, and I had to agree with it is you've kind of expanded that repertoire by what you don't play and the way you phrase things and the way you time things and the spaces that you leave in between them it's like you've made it a, 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 a bigger vocabulary. And that's what you notice with these, these fiddle tunes is, yeah, you, you'll hear all the classic stuff there, but there's something special you're bringing to it. Oh, um, thank you. I appreciate both, that. Bo both in the playing as well as in just, you know, the phrasing and, and the, the style and, and everything. So Good. that's just Yeah, well, favorite. I appreciate you saying that. And I think when you were saying that, I was thinking it's kind of like being a writer, you know, just like, having your sense of 
you know, what to leave out and where those commas and periods are, are kind of where you start to be identifiable. And that's something that I try to, I try to think about, um, not just, unlike how I might be speaking now, <laughs> you know, not just making run on sentences and things like that. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's true. There are only 12 notes, um, you know, and, and when you think about it, when you're in a key, seven of them are on the inside. So, you know, I mean, it, it's, there's, a, there's a minimalist um, perspective on it, but on the other hand, I think there's only nine digits involved in the Powerball numbers too, and, and I still don't win, you know? So there's, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of combinations. Um, yeah. Very good. Well, wow. <laughs> and to, to, to go a little guitar wise, mm -hmm. it, it's pretty unusual to be playing it on a smaller body guitar, especially when you look at traditional bluegrass or when you look at bluegrass it, as we see it today, where mm -hmm. in reality, they were played on really small guitars. Yeah. You know, right. it, 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 so wow, what's it like to have a custom guitar to play on? <laughs> yeah, well, um, you know, I, I mean, I've gotten that same thing when I was more in the jazz world. You know, I mean, I guess, you know, I'm still in the jazz world or whatever, but, you know, um, why don't you play an arch top or whatever? I, you know, you just, you, you play what uh, resonates the most with you. You know, at some point, if you're an artist, you find the tool that it's just, it sounds like you and that's your voice, no matter what it is that you're saying. So, um, yeah, I never once felt like, well, I'm playing a jazz tune, I should get an arch top and some flat wounds and a fedora. And, um, you know, I, I guess it's the same way with this music. So playing a small, still string guitar when I kind of arrived at that and like this feels like you know whatever it is deep down in here you know <laughs> it's uh it's deeper than just the interface you know um back in the projection room <laughs> there's uh <laughs> there's this is the sound that 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 I relate to the most I think to, to, to overthink it for one minute. I've always, I, I don't play the piano even though I was a music major, so I can probably play a whole bunch of scales and chords, but I can't actually play a single tune for you. Um, but but I always loved, and I listened to mostly like, well, if I listen to any kind of like classical or jazz, it, it's almost always piano. I almost never listen to jazz guitar that much. I've never really been that into it. But I love um, piano and I just love that it covers such an enormous, uh, frequency range and that there's so much sustain you know that that ringing kind of sound those layers and things and to me that's what a steel string guitar is it's it, it's 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 an, it's an acoustic piano you know electric guitar is like a Rhodes piano super cool you know and and as a you know as a recordist or whatever like it sits in the mix in this amazing way um, but to sit and play by myself there's something about a steel string that just feels like a piano and it, it's complete, it's got the sustain and, um, and this broad frequency range. Um, and it's self-contained, it's like a laptop. I don't have to plug it into anything. Like, uh, you know, the whole electric guitar thing just seems like a pain in the neck to me. Um, so yeah, that's why I play that one guitar, no matter what I'm playing, you know, what style I might be. We, we should probably, um add a little in here because there might be a few people listening to this who aren't members of the Santa Cruz Guitar Player Forum um, or who may not be as familiar with Santa Cruz guitars or with Eric Sky. Um, so you play a signature model Santa Cruz guitar that you and Richard Hoover developed. Um, and I think for a lot of the guitar geeks, it's a very specialized guitar. And I've all often wondered what what instruments did you go through and what did you pick up from them that helped you put this together? I mean, what were what were some of the highs and lows of, of uh, things that you played or did in the past that that got you to this instrument? Yeah. Uh, well. Well. Th uh, yeah. Okay. Well. Let's let's get in there. Let's talk gear, man. Let's talk shop. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, well, I've always been a steel string guitar guy. I mean, I went through phases of having an electric guitar here, and then I usually sell it in a panic, like, I can't do this, you know. Um, and there's almost always been a classical guitar in the house. I mean, that was kind of my first thing, not actually playing classical guitar, like, um, but, you know, I've always had um, a classical guitar, and I still have one in the house. Uh, my father gave me when I uh, uh, for when I was 15, and that's the one I kind of sat on the edge of the bed with the Mel Bay books and stuff, you know. But 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 the steel string has been sort of a constant for a while. There was a Yamaha 12 string where I took off six. Uh, one of my girlfriends did a giant oil painting, you know, on it and stuff. <laughs> and then I, I played that one for a long time. Uh, was that just to get the wider neck that you wanted, or? <laughs> No, I actually wanted a 12 string and I, and I did stick with that for a while. And I think it kind of built up my hands. I'm not a big believer that you need strong hands to do this, but I think, you know, at, at that point, I, I did think that was a cool thing to do. Yeah, it's kind of like playing a harpsichord. The 12 string is just a, a really weird, I mean, it's really cool, but it's a really weird thing. Um, I certainly love the way Ralph Towner plays it. Um, yeah, and then I and then I got like an ovation, you know, and I played that for a while because that was the '80s, so you had to have that kind of round back, you know, and it right, plugged yeah. in really good and stuff. Um, and around then was my first exposure to Santa Cruz guitars. My friend uh, uh, Ron La France, who was still a good friend of mine down in Santa Clara, he had a friend. Uh, he might have been an engineer, you know, there's like a value or something. This must have been about 1985, maybe. He said that he had a Santa Cruz guitar, and I, you know, I he was going to bring it over, and I had to see it, you know, and and uh, and it was an OM, um, um, and it was, you know, light as a bag of chips, you know, and uh, it just was gigantic sounding, you know, just amazing, yeah, and and then I didn't see or hear anything about it again, you know, and then I think it, I think then I saw, you know, Richard and Fretz magazine, you know, in the 80s and stuff, um, but, you know, obviously it was a boutique shop, you know, at that time, well, especially in the 80s, everybody had like a pink Stratocaster with a tremolo bar on it, there wasn't much of any acoustic guitars around, but what there was, of course, was dominated by like Ovation, inexpensive Yamahas, and, uh, you know, Martin or whatever. Um, so, you know, then um, a little later on when I started making records, I, I had a little bit of a relationship with Taylor Guitars for a while. Um, so some people might might remember that going back to my first album. And um, and that was really nice. They were, they were very generous and, and made me um, a bunch of different guitars and stuff. And that was kind of neat because I really did get to experiment with a lot of different things. And I think it was around that time that I, I really kind of refined my idea that I, really was only attracted to smaller guitars. I don't remember what their nomenclature is or whatever, but you know, like OMs and and a skosh smaller, I guess, you know. Um, and then and then a couple of years later, uh, I met uh, Willie Carter, who was uh, doing, um, uh, the, the, the guitar builder in Santa Cruz, was doing artist relations at Santa Cruz. And uh, I was just playing in Griffin. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> and I had coincidentally finally bought my first Santa Cruz. I think it was an OMPW like a year or so before that. And I was starting to transition. Like I was bringing that to all my gigs and stuff. And, uh, and he asked me about that and I told him that and, and, and we hit it off really well. And then he invited me to meet Richard. And, and then when I, when I met Richard, the first thing, uh, that first day I ordered <laughs> a double O uh, guitar. And wow. And um, when that, when I got that guitar, you know, some months later, that was my first double O that I owned. And uh, I, that, I haven't played anything else since, you know, uh, just the little double O guitars. It was just so, you know, again, it, it just felt like how I feel back in the projection room, you know, just, it just clicked like, okay, I'm done. You know, I went through it. I know a lot of musicians go through the gear thing. You're trying all different guitars all the time and stuff. And, you know, I'm with that with other things like maybe microphones or plugins for computers and things like that. Right? <laughs> but for guitars, I mean, I was just basically done, you know, like this is my voice. And then this thing is, you know, the best <laughs> version of that, you know? Um, and I just was, I was really content and, um, you know, I was really taken with how resonant and 
uh, how much sustain and all the things I was describing earlier that that I appreciate so much about the acoustic piano. And it's loud and, and loud is good. You know, it's, it's, you don't have to be ashamed to say loud is better, you know, when you're an acoustic guitar player, because it, it, they, they are quieter instruments compared to other, you know, acoustic instruments. And to, to record well and to perform well, you know, that, that volume really does help. So, you know, that was, that was a real nice thing. And then, and then I guess it was around the time that my slow moving dog record came out um, that I used that first Santa Cruz double O on that Richard asked about, you know, doing a signature guitar, uh, like, you know, designing a double O. And so we thought about that and went back and forth, um, you know, with the emails and phone calls, cause you know, we're 700, I'm, in, I'm, up, I'm up in Portland at that time. And um, yeah, so it just became like, well, what, you know, that that other guitar was was basically a standard Santa Cruz double O. I think the only thing that was different was it was an Adirondack top because I think that at that time the I think the standard was uh, Sitka, which I love also. But you know, so it became this conversation about well, what would you do? You know, if you, what else? What else would you do to it? And so I think um, I actually have one here. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> It's like a cooking show. Here, here yeah, it is. Yeah. It came out of the oven. <laughs> I don't know. Can you see that? Okay, I can't really see yeah. myself on here. Okay, yeah. So, um, so I'll just point to things. <laughs> so I think the the main thing for me was like I kind of thinking about the the geometry a little bit in terms of playing. So a little wider uh, string spacing. I think the standard double O is one and a three quarter inch nut, and this is. 11 16 or 13 16 one and 13 16 so that's a 16th of an inch wider um you know to the lay person <laughs> it probably sounds ridiculous but it, it's really a it's a huge difference and and i find that when i'm playing kind of bigger chords and uh a more elaborate chords or whatever that i can play more cleanly um so sometimes with a wider neck you know somebody can pick up a guitar well that's just you know that's just too wide and i get it you know the skinnier little electric guitar thing would 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 be great but um having that space to play more cleanly just in the long run it's just it's just so nice so so that was a thing and then also for the right hand um increased it slightly from uh two and three sixteenths to two and a quarter so essentially four sixteenths so again another sixteenth of an inch wider there just to be able to kind of uh to get my fingers in there a little bit more, being primarily a finger style player, so just a little bit more depth, um, but not too wide, uh, you know, which is relative, of course, but a lot of old Martins will be like five sixteenths. Um, and when I'm flat picking, the strings just feel, it's quite a leap from one to the other for me, you know. Too far so apart. This, yeah, so this seemed, seemed like the, the perfect thing. So getting that just right, Mm -hmm. um, again, if you're lay, a lay person, it, 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 I know this all sounds insane, but it's like if you're a skier, I mean, you can't just, like, you got to get the bindings just the way, you know, so they fit your foot, you know, and and, and so they, I, I don't know anything about skiing, but you know what I'm trying to say. Um, so that was really important. And then also the scale length. So this yeah. scale length is 24.9, which is kind of the old Martin scale, um, whereas I think that their standard uh, double O is 24 and um, three quarters. So I believe that's another 16th of an inch. So these are little, <laughs> these are little baby adjustments, but you know, you're, so what's this effectively happening is you're pulling the string a, a tiny bit tighter, right? So the string is just that ever bit more taunt in order, you know, at the same pitch. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I feel that, you know, I, I, I like that. And um and of course, it also affects how far apart the uh, the um, frets are spaced, and um, mm -hmm. you know, divided amongst <laughs> twenty frets, these are little little changes. But you know, I, I noticed those. It also uh, ultimately affects, I believe, although uh, somebody else could chime in here, I might be wrong about this, but how many frets you can have clear of the body, um, because that all adds up. So if you have a, a longer scale, um, you know, it's going to be a different mm -hmm. amount of amount of frets and it's just really important for me to have exactly 20. Um, I think, I think, I think uh, Richard and I were in St. Louis doing, you know, kind of a, a Santa Cruz guitar night 
thing uh, about a year ago, and I was I was I was using the guitars that the dealers had, and and I was playing something. It, it might have been um, the F model or the new FTC. I don't know what it was, but I think it had twenty one or nineteen frets. But you know, in the middle of a tune, like I just I have my eyes closed, and I just know where that twentieth fret is, unless I don't. Anyway, <laughs> um, so that was. Uh, yeah. Not not on YouTube. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, so, anyway. Go well, ahead. and you <laughs> also you also have um Adirondack bracing and hot hide glue as standard on yours, which I think was uh um an option previously, although I think they're offering it now as standard on a lot of their guitars uh as of recently oh, okay uh and was it your choice or richard's choice to go with coca bolo for the back and sides and what sure what prompted that because their standard model is east indian rosewood that's right yeah so uh well um as for the um the hot hide glue um yeah you know and i was vegan at the time so that was a uh, um <laughs> a, mor a moral choice <laughs> Yeah, no, I like the way it smells. Um, no, you know, I didn't, I, I don't think I was quite as hip to the um, um, the glue thing, you know, but, um, but, but Richard and I talked about that, you know, and, and, uh, and I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> you know, let's do that. That sounds great. It's, it's let's, let's go deluxe, you know, let's, <laughs> um, and of course, having the Adirondack braces, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, in terms of the Coco Bolo um, backs and sides, first I should mention, uh, there's a, we also increased the depth of the guitar um, by about a quarter inch, about the thickness of the, the uh, trim. <laughs> and just to get, you know, in my mind, like a little more oomph, because that really kind of adds up, right? It gives you a little bit more, um, you know, of a, of a bigger box, but not really deep. So, so I've played a lot of uh, other makers where they'll do like small guitars that are really deep body and they're really deep. And um, I noticed that when I'm playing them, it's actually kind of a cool experience because you do get that bass, you know, you get, but I think it's at the expense of projection. And uh, so when you get a really small, deep body guitar, my experience a lot of times is, is that the, it gets kind of stuck in there. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, and this, you know, slightly deeper, but still shallow compared to, you know, a, a dreadnought or, or, or some people's, you know, really deep body guitars. It, it's just, it's putting out more, you know, it's more, it's a classical guitar with steel strings, basically. I mean, it's really like the same size as like a Hauser, right? Um, so, you know, <laughs> I think that uh, you know, the classical guys, they, I think they figured it out a long time ago, you know, the 12 fret body, the smaller, so I, I think there's some things that uh, they figured out a while ago in terms of projection and, and volume right. and whatnot. Anyway, to that end, and to your actual question, Coca Bolo is a very, very heavy and dense wood. If you've been in the shop and you've picked up a set, it's like, wow, I think African black wood is kind of similar. And so um, I think, you know, I'm going to sound like I know what I'm talking about, but I think the thinking is, is that, you know, it's going to make a pretty rigid back and really kind of move things forward. So it's just, I think it's, um, I find that Coco Bolo guitars also project really well. This is a theme for me. I like guitars. I like it to feel like it's out, it's happening like two or three feet out in front of me is where it's all kind of coming together, which is usually where the microphones are, <laughs> um, that kind of thing. So that's what I appreciate from Coco Bolo. I also hear it as being, um, slightly glassier uh in the lows in the in the in the in the low range stuff the the sort of 100 through 300 hertz kind of range it's not as kind of wooly as um maybe uh indian um indian rosewood however uh when you know when we were cooking up this guitar. I mean, Richard, <laughs> Richard was like, it can be anything, you know, you can do whatever you want to do, which is, is insane. You know, I still can't believe it. Right. 10 years later. Um, and yeah, Indian Rosewood was definitely the top of my list. I love Indian Rosewood. I'm one of the few people I like it more than Brazilian. I like it more than a lot, even though it's so ubiquitous and it's just kind of the standard thing, but there's something about it that the notes are just like a little slower coming out. They, they kind of, 
bloom up and and uh, they, that the whole thing I was kind of talking about earlier, uh, I think <laughs> maybe it was with you guys. I don't know yes. about um, uh, <laughs> about like kind of the natural reverb that's happening inside a guitar. Um, that Indian rosewood really really has that. So um, anyway. But we went with Coco Bolo anyway. And I think that that has kind of one foot in that world. It's definitely a rosewood. It's got that kind of reverby sound, but it's just maybe a little bit more, um, you know, just a tiny bit tighter in the low, in the low end. Right. And, and that's pretty much the only guitar you played for 10 plus years, um, mm -hmm. with the exception of all the guitars that people must shove into your hands every time you show up somewhere saying, try my guitar. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's so weird for me too because I am such a uh, one guitar person. Um, I don't know, just for want of another quick analogy, that's like being the skier. It's like, here, jump into my bindings and go down the slope really fast. You know, like, like I mean, this is what I'm, I'm used to. Um, yeah, like when I was explaining this, you know, last year, like getting a guitar with, or with 21 frets or 19 frets or, um, Oh, another thing was, uh, I think when we were in Chicago, I played uh, just an amazing sounding and looking and just a killer uh, H13. But then it occurred to me after I'd already started the tune, I'm like, wow, 13 frets. This is going to be a real sobriety test. Because to me, E is this. It's, it's when my hand hits here. You know, it's not something I'm looking for. And, and it turns out it wasn't there. You know? <laughs> um, but... Um, yeah, so it's always weird playing uh, other guitars, and and you know there's 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 so many great guitars in the world, but um, for me, you know, this is yeah, this yeah. Is, uh, I'm content. I'm just really content. So, so you can only play it. You can only play an H13 with a capo at the first fret. Yeah, well, that's the other thing is I always use I always use a capo. I mean, almost I mean most of the time I have a capo on the guitar too. So yeah, it, it gets pretty weird pretty fast. That's that's why I like to play with my eyes closed because once you start trying to you know make sense of it all, you're you're it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Whereas most of us yes. have our eyes very wide open when yes, we're is. playing because it's it's constantly where am I where, well, where am I know, supposed to be. I mean, you know, I don't know. If, I mean, I don't know if anybody's looking for guitar tips, but that that's something I like to, you know, I mean, I, I'm looking, I'm watching too a lot of the times, but you don't want to get too locked into that. Um, just because we're all on the West Coast, I'll get a little woo-woo on you, but it's almost like there's sort of hemispheres of, of awareness when you're playing, like, and I feel like, you know, everything kind of below this midline is me trying to remember notes, shapes of chords, all of that stuff. And when it comes time to record or perform, you know, I should have already kind of been there. And it's now, I want to kind of be up here where I'm thinking about tone and, and uh, you know, comp I don't know, just, you know, I want to be more um, just thinking about the things that are really going to matter to the listener, being inspired, being dynamic, you know, being expressive. And uh, sometimes I'll catch myself kind of you know, like, I don't know, for me, like the most intense kind of gigs are like when you're live on the radio, there's just something about like the wheels are off the runway and you don't have the audience to kind of smear the whole thing. You know? <laughs> and, um, and sometimes like that red light will go on and I'll be looking at the guitar and think, whoa, I play the guitar? <laughs> wow, like, like, the first chord, I think it's a B. What is a B? I don't know. What's a B? You know, and, and, you know, you can't go into that monkey mind thing, you know, and so kind of being up here and not looking too much is really helpful. That said, anytime you can make a big position shift, it's good to look. <laughs> so um, that's why, <laughs> um, to continue on with my uh, Tupperware show here, um, there's actually extra dots on the side of my guitar because when I do do a shift, you know, I do want to land in the right spot. So I have dots on the 15th, 17th, and 19th. I remember that was one of the things that Richard and I went back and forth. I'm like, can you just put me like two more dots up there? So when I'm up high, I, you know, hit the right notes and stuff. <laughs> so, well, now this is all a very good lead in to one of the things we wanted to talk about. And that was a while back, mm -hmm. you recorded Eric Skye's 30 day guitar challenge with a series right. of 30, I don't know. Well, I guess lessons would be um, semi-appropriate. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but, but challenges um, to try and help people improve uh, their playing. It, it was quite challenging for me, I can say. Uh, a number of the uh, challenges I never quite rose to, uh, mm -hmm. but it was good to give a try. Um, what inspired you to do that? And is that something you would do again? Oh, well, thanks for asking. Yeah, I, you know, I, that was, seems like so long ago now <laughs> that I, I remember um, one of my longtime students. So I have a couple, I'm really feel just incredibly grateful, but I think I have six students now that are over the 10 year mark that have you know, been coming to my house this whole time. Well, they're not, not, they're not coming now. They've been coming to the back porch. Um, so, you know, I have a lot of um, students and I, I've been teaching for a really long time now. And I think a, a few years ago, whatever that was, I feel like I'm going to say it was four years ago or something. It had occurred to me that it had been 30 years since I had taken my first uh, student. And I wow. mentioned that to the student that I mentioned, uh, Mark McPherson. And he's like, and I think it was his idea. I don't know if it was my idea or his idea, but it was like, well, let's make some 30 lessons or something. So he, he brought his video camera over and, and we shot those. And they're all just very stream of consciousness. Like I haven't watched them since, I don't know what the hell I said, but the concept was that in 30 years of teaching, what I've decided has made the most difference in students is all the stuff that has no chord diagrams or scales or, you know, basically if I had to sum it up, like the point of it was, and I'm sure it's meandering and weird in places, but you know, the point, the point of it really is just the things that people will notice, you know, that'll make you a better player have nothing to do with that. It's, it's much more about, you know, tone and, and time and phrasing. And, and I know there's stuff about, you know, posture and getting inspiration, finding your own voice. Um, I don't remember all 30, <laughs> you know, singing while you play at the same time, this eyes closed stuff maybe a couple little preachy points that I do feel really strongly about, about like being able to name all the notes on the fretboard. I don't care if you can read music or whatever, but just if you can name all the notes. Um, anyway, so there's just the sort of list of things that I think are the most important. And it's just trusting that uh, the world is full of all kinds of ways to play the G major scale um, or all different versions of tunes for you to learn. But how can you take those tunes and elevate them, you know, up that next, or maybe that last, I know there's never really a last, but like that last five or 10%, you know, that, um, I mean, I always like to say, if you can just play one or two chords, but people can really uh, tap their foot to what you're doing, you know, unconsciously, um, you know, then they'll always say, wow, what is that, what, what is that you're playing? That, that's really good, you know? And then you could play something that I think 90% of guitar players would think is really good. Like, watch, look at all this, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but if it's, if you're not, if you're just trying to get the notes out, you're not trying to like kind of really be consciously aware of each individual note and make a beautiful sound. And if it's not, you know, in a pocket, then, you know, no one's gonna, in my opinion, it, it might be interested for four or five seconds, you know, it's, it's kind of a, uh, a spectacle or a feat of, of cool guitar playing. But the things that really matter to us unconsciously as human beings are like this time and your tone and groove and style and phrasing and all that stuff. So as I remember, that, that was the stuff I was trying to talk about um, yeah. with the 30 day guitar challenge stuff. And it's still a big part of, of my teaching today. We, uh, students come, we sit up, you know, lately on my back porch and, and we play tunes for 45 minutes, um, but when it's time to talk about stuff, it, it almost always comes back to, to stuff like that. I mean, and incidentally, I can show you a lot of ways to play the G major scale and things like that too. Right. Uh, but none of that matters, <laughs> you know, if you're not making a, a beautiful sound in a way that makes people wanna kind of lock into it with their body. Beautiful. Good, no, that, 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 that's great. That's, it's, it's a, it was, um... It was unique in the way you presented it and the kind of lessons you tried to give there. Um, and I think that that was what was so attractive. And plus a lot of them were very short. I mean, they just like, oh, 
you know, light bulb moment. Um, yeah, they're just essays. I don't, I don't think I played at all. I don't, and I don't know. I think the challenge, because it's not, there's not really a challenge. They're really just video essays. I think it was when I was on the, um, I was on the road around that time more. And I remember um, I was doing this uh, 30 day yoga challenge. <laughs> and I think that that's where it, it kind of hit me. Like, I don't know. Like, so well, rather, it was like a YouTuber, like, you know, yeah. anyway. So rather than bringing a small goat with you, you had a, a guitar and... Yeah, a laptop, a yoga mat, a French press, have guitar, we'll travel. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's, let's gear it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I know you're very specific on your capo. Mm -hmm. I know that you vary from picks with picks from time to time. You taught mm -hmm. me. You taught me a tremendous amount about um, the tone of a pick. Yeah. Uh, and um, then, then we'll talk about your twelve-step program for microphones. Oh yeah. <laughs> you, you, you certainly, you certainly have uh, have have made me aware of things, and I thought I was fairly aware, but. You certainly made me aware of some microphones that um, are pretty special. So yeah, mics are cool. Um, okay, so what did you ask about? K uh, K Capo well, and picks. Uh, okay, yeah. So gear stuff, because um, I get asked about gear stuff all the time, and and uh, I don't have a lot of gear, you know. I'm, uh, so it's it's usually a quick conversation. Um, but the but the pieces that I do have, I've put a lot of thought into, and and. Uh, so I used capo by uh, Phil Elliott. So Elliott capos, um, they're just beautiful capos. I have, I have two of them because I have two double O skies and one lives on one and one lives on the other. And I only take them off uh, when I change strings or put the guitar, uh, you know, when I'm packing up to go on an airplane or something like that. But otherwise they kind of live back there. I think years ago I had a guitar tech put some shrink the kind of like sort of rubber wire stuff you hit it with a hair dryer and shrinks around it so so i don't I, I imagine you guys can't see this but you know the arms of the capo uh, have a little bit of rubber there and so and it doesn't seem to interact with the finish but more importantly it makes it so it doesn't chew up the wood <laughs> at the nut so it still looks perfect there after all these years but they live there um yeah so the elliot capo is the kind of capo that it has a um a mechanism by which you you can adjust the tightening with this with the screw and it's being pulled from the center and and I feel like that that works particularly well in terms of having minimal effect on intonation um, and I can make little micro adjustments if I hit a chord and it's kind of buzzy and I can pull down the kind of closed pin styles um, might be perfect for your exact you know guitar or they might be a little tight in which case you're always going sharp. <laughs> Uh, or they might be a little loose. I don't, I don't know if that's really a, a thing, but if it was, it would be that, you know, that you were buzzing or something. But I like how the, um, the Elliot allows you to kind of put it down and just, you know, kind of find that spot really quickly and boom, you know, you're in tune. Sometimes you gotta do a little bit of tweaking and you know, that, that's fine. Um, anyway, and so he makes them custom. So, you know, I was able to order one with a one and, 13, 16, he would, he would do whatever you want. So they're not cheap, um, but that's okay. <laughs> it's something I yeah. use every day. And um, let's see, you asked about, well, here's a random one for you because people are always asking about this, but I use uh, something called the neck up to prop up my guitar. I don't know if you can see this, but it's, a, it's sort of a leather strap with a suction cup and a place for the end pin to go in. So I kind of put it on my, through my end pin and then stick it to the finish of the guitar, which by the way, is not the greatest idea in the world. Um, but, um, you know, just leave it off when not in use basically, because it will interact with the nitro. Um, but not, not, you know, I don't look at that part of the guitar anyway, but this one, this on my, on my number one, this is, this is the second guitar that I made me, my other one, it's kind of got a little funky there or whatever. But anyway, so I put that little suction cup and then it just sits on my guitar you know, kind of hands free. So it's like a strap, it's strapless. <laughs> it's a strapless strap. Um, or I call it my kickstand, but it puts my guitar in this sort of perfect place for me. And I, honest to God, I mean, I cannot play without it. Um, but I got it from um, Mad Dog, <laughs> a dear friend of the form. Uh, 
his wife sent it to me, I think uh, shortly after um, he passed and it was random. And I mean, in other words, I wasn't expecting it. But at that time, I remember uh, I, was, I was on tour. I wasn't on tour, but I'd done a couple shows with um, Michael Chaplin, the classical guitar player, the killer classical guitar player, and uh, Mark Hansen, Grammy award-winning fingerstyle guitar player from uh, here in Portland also. And there's a, there's a shot of all three of us playing at the same time on stage, shot from one side, and you can see us all you know, sitting there. And someone wrote, I think on social media, it just said, posture, colon, the good, the bad, the ugly. Well, I was, of course, you know, the ugly. And, and I, cause you know, I'm a big guy and, and I got this little guitar and I'm hunched over and night after night I'd get up say thank you and I'd still be shaped like the chair. Um, and I was starting to really have back problems. And then this thing came in the mail, I'm like, what is this? And you know, since then it's like my back has been great um, and it just puts me in the right position. So the capo, the kickstand, otherwise known as the neck up, those are, those are really important to me. You asked about the flat pick. Uh, some people know that, well, the, the people who live in my house, <laughs> my kids and my wife know that this is just the pick. I mean, there's, there is a couple of them, but there's one that I've been using pretty much 95% uh, of the time the last decade or so. And um, it's an old piece of tortoise shell that a guy in Eugene, um, I sent him a pick that I really liked and he copied it meticulously in, in uh, some tortoise shell that he had had for many years from an old comb or something. And um, it's a 1.5 millimeter uh, kind of traditional sort of bluegrassy three corner shape. And that's pretty much all I use. I have a couple others that are, they're in little Ziploc plastic bags stashed away. Um, there's one that tortoise, kind of bevels itself in a way. And, and, and as it wears down, it gets this sort of brush surface that's really yummy. And, and a couple of them are like in really perfect tonal zone. And so I have them stored and hermetically sealed. So if I'm gonna do like an album or something, like the June Apple record, like I have that pick set aside. And it's getting stupid, but you know. And then I have a couple that I've never used cause I think I, you know, I, need, I need them to go the distance. But that's how I am with picks. Um, but there's definitely some um, commercial picks that I really like. I think the um, the blue chip picks are really great. You can get a one and a half millimeter same shape with that. Um, I have a couple. I usually end up with 1500 grit sandpaper and taking the point off a little bit. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Probably more than you wanted to know about a pick. It, no. You know, it, it, the thing that you the thing that you you turned me on about them was dropping them on a on a on a counter. And listening to the sound that they make when you drop them on a counter, yeah, and I, that was the, that was a, a, a mind-expanding moment for me. That was just like, whoa, yeah, it does sound different, doesn't it? Yeah, okay. right. It has this right. It doesn't like like a celluloid pick kind of has this thud, and like a tortoiseshell pick. But also some there's some really like the red. I think Red Bear still makes picks. I mean, there's some other commercial products. I don't want to like promote some, first of all, tortoiseshell picks are illegal. So I, <laughs> I want to promote contraband. <laughs> um, so there's definitely some commercial picks that have that same thing. But I think, yeah, when you drop a pick on, on a, like a table or something and it, and it has this sort of tink, tink or almost, um, yeah, just kind of like a tile, like a little tile. Um, that's, that's usually a sound that I'm gonna, I'm gonna like the sound of. But the most important thing about a pick <laughs> is what you do with it. So I, I don't, this isn't really the right circumstance maybe to demonstrate or whatever. And you can, I, I'm pretty sure I did this on 30 day guitar challenge, but you know, the picking down into the guitar and then picking kind of back out away from the guitar, as opposed to just across the strings makes a huge difference because in the former you're making that string kind of move that I don't know if this is really true. This is, this is me just, <laughs> just talking out loud. But, you know, in the form of the string, I feel like it's kind of going more up and down and it's kind of working the top more. And in the latter, you're just kind of going across the strings. Now, I don't know if you can hear this, but I'll just, I'm gonna play my B string um, and I'm gonna pick kind of down, in, down into it. Now I'm gonna pick across it. So we'll do a before and after.
so that that motion is easily 50 times the difference between Indian rosewood and you know and yeah, yeah. Brazilian rosewood or something like that. You know, so uh, I still think you should get a new guitar because <laughs> uh, it's good for the people that I love. And but um, but you know, when people say tone is in your hands, uh, it, they're not bullshitting. You know, I mean, what you do—it's like a violin bow. I mean, how you dig in and where you dig in, and 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 the torque that you—you know—so, so really, you should spend some time. Um, this kind of goes back to the thirty-day guitar challenge and just sort of the zen of the basics. You should really just sit on the mountaintop and just play your open B string with a pick for a while. And uh, I'm serious as a heart attack. And then see if you can then uh, play a couple notes with your left hand, like get your right left hand out of it, but just sit there and find this place. It's like, a, you know, like, like, I don't really know anything about golf, so this is more me talking on my butt here, but I'm imagining if you're, if you're a wealthy guy and you're really into uh, golf that you'd pay some pro like a, a shitload of money to, to sit and just show you how to hold the club for two hours before you ever swing the thing, you know? And um, I think with your technique, it should be, I know classical players think this way, you know, you got to get just right, get, get your set point, right? And um, that's how I think about the pick and trying to get my tone. It's like, I have this set point that I come back to. Now, does this sometimes fall apart? You know, when I pick up the pace a little bit, sometimes my, my hand straightens out and, um, and I'm playing a little bit more across the strings and not so much sort of down and then out. Uh, but you know, and whatever, but when everything's going well, and especially when I have a tune that's at a tempo where I can do the things I'm describing, that's kind of how I'm thinking. And it's from spending time just playing an open string with no left hand, paying attention, um, reverse engineering. I think every guitar player has had this moment when you're maybe sitting in your back porch and you're playing, you're like, God, everything's, everything I do is just great today, you know? I mean, believe me, I have a lot of days when I'm sitting there going, wow, I played the guitar. <laughs> this, is, this is not going well, man, you know, but, there, but the, sometimes you have this day, you're just like, everything's going great. And uh, what I always tell students is stop and write down what's happening, you know, see if you can reverse engineer. How are you holding your guitar at this moment? Um, you know, what'd you have for breakfast? I don't know. You know what I mean? But try to reverse engineer your successes and, um, and try to find your set point so you can get back to that place. So it really. What were we talking about, man? No. <laughs> microphones. Um, oh, microphones. Oh, Jesus. I was no, we just were, showing that, no, that no, I have the pick that you gave me many years ago, Eric, and it stays in a special pocket here that I oh, carry great. with me at all times. Oh, good. So. <laughs> Put a little lavender in there. Yeah. Yeah. I was. I was. I was just. I was just thinking about when you were talking about that process of learning. And just playing the B string, you know, it, it's kind of like, gee, you should just put your iPhone in front of you on slow mo, and sit there and, and watch yourself, you know, and yeah. then you could hear kind, you'd hear kind of what was going on with it and stuff like that, and then you could see it, and then you could really, because it really is about these minute adjustments, you know. If you were a singer, this would be super basic stuff. Every yeah, every, yeah. every vocal teacher has you standing in front of a mirror. Yeah. And finding this place where, you know, if you're ready to sing, like getting that, your belly's, you know, you got to put one hand on your belly and you got to feel that thing come out and you're being trained to have this way of, of attacking every note. Well, it, it, it's just so, it's just, it, it, it's just so back to basics. It's so the right thing to do, you know, versus sitting there and going, well, I can get really fast, you know, and I can get my, my muscle memory to, to do all this stuff, but if it, if your technique is, is not right, or it doesn't have a groove, or it's not in time, you know, I, I, why bother? You know, you know the I, older I get, the more I'm obsessed with the idea of the basics. It's the basics of everything, in every art, in yeah. cooking, in marriage, you know, whatever. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's these really basic things that matter the, the most, well, or certainly make everything come to life. Yeah. Yeah, and, and what you were saying about the picking uh, coincides very s closely to what Lisa Liu was telling us oh, she's when we so were great. talking with her. Yeah, uh, she has a, a picking technique that you know she was showing very briefly that 
you know, it's like just practice, 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 practice. It's the most basic. Once you get this down, then you can worry about everything else. Yeah, she's a gem. And uh, she gave me uh, a little lesson in picking at the last NAMM show because she has just, she's such a formidable technique. It's just like, yeah. it's yeah. eye popping, you know? It's, it's <laughs> hey, how really you doing something. that, you know? And, and then, um, and you know what? I think that that was really influential because it kind of reinforced this idea of kind of going down into the guitar. You know, she does kind of like a rest stroke. Um, yeah, she's 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 really great. <laughs> uh, what are you cooking? Am I cooking? <laughs> yeah. What are you making? What what what? As we sit here now, no, I don't. I, it's possible that there's a fire going on somewhere, but I don't hear any sirens. But there's there's a whole bunch of um, things in the oven that are roasting slowly right now. There are um, two different. Uh, one, I can't remember the name of, it's pretty exotic. And the other one is just uh, acorn squash, but I love winter squash. Um, so at this time of year, I'm always coming home with just tons of winter squash. Gosh, I wish I could remember the name of this one. It's big blue. It's like a, looks like a giant green pumpkin. I mean, it essentially is, but it's a, it's like, uh, I don't know, kobosh or something. Anyway, uh, anyway, so squash, those are roasting slowly right now. And uh, so when I'm done, and I'm caramelizing two big yellow onions. So when I'm, when we're done here, I was gonna get a bunch of coconut milk and make uh, a roasted curried squash soup. For wow, that night. sounds good. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds really good. That's what you meant by what's cooking, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That wasn't like a jazz guy thing. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> you no. weren't hoping I was going to play a 12 bar blues or something, right? No, no, I was, I was, I was going because I've been, I've been watching the, you know, I mean, I've, I've been fortunate enough to watch some growth in your family and, and watch your kids grow up a little bit and things like that. And, and now that I see them becoming chefs as well. I mean, your daughter. Yeah, both daughters really. But yeah, but Taylor in particular is like, she has a lot of natural ability. It's pretty amazing. She's hitting some real home runs there with combinations of food. And it's like, yeah, when we get, when we figure out how to make this, we can scratch this thing and we can smell it then too, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we'll, then we'll just be hog heaven. Yeah. So did well, you really I, want to ask me about microphones? Well, you got me on this Lewitt thing. I I did not get you on a Lewitt you, thing. You did start. You started. Me. <laughs> you said. Oh, I've never mentioned Lewitt mics. I just became hip to them. Uh, I'm currently right now. I've been talking to the people in Austria about Austria. Is it Austria? Austria Audio. Yeah. Or Austrian Audio. Uh, audio. But that's a lot to say, isn't it? <laughs> say that three times fast. Yeah. Um, now that's a company I'm I'm hoping maybe I'm, I'm trying to see if they would send me some mics to check out you know but uh, that's a company I'm uh, that I'm really uh, interested in because they're making now if anyone's listening if you tune out I'll understand because this can get beyond nerdy yeah we're beyond, beyond, it goes we're, way beyond so just we're you know, guys give the, me like the signal the finger deep, whatever you deep. want. We're so deep in it right here. Yeah, but you know, like I, I really love the AKG 414s. It's just, that's my desert island. That's my double O, that'll always be my desert island. And that comes in a lot of different flavors and, and whatnot. I mean, I have like a, the ones that I'm, I'm using most of the time are these uh, 414, I think they're just the Bs. You know, it's, it's basically what the XLS is now. This, or you could just say the silver one. Um, the gold ones, I really, I really like a lot too. I know Goldenberg has, uh, some from the early 70s. I think we recorded a little bit yeah. with, with his pair. And those are the ones that have the original brass capsule in them. And that capsule, which was in the C12, which is, I mean, I, I think those mics are seven, dollars $8,000 now. I mean, they're really expensive microphones. But as far as I know, back in the day, AKG with their whole factory could make like two a day. Like the, uh, the yield was uh, like 20% or less. So these like, basically you're soldering hair, you know, <laughs> inside there. And, and, and they, they would work all day and they're like, oh, well, that didn't work. That didn't work. That didn't work. And so, you know, they kind of abandoned that capsule after a while because, you know, it's not the best business model in the world, right? And so this company, Austrian Audio, as far as I can tell, 
when AKG moved production to somewhere, I don't know where, but not in Austria anymore, all those people that got let go started this company. And some of them are, I think one of those guys is in their 80s, but these are guys that, you know, were making that capsule back in the day. So they're making it again. And apparently with, um, you know, like an updated version of it, they're not trying to be like copies of the four, old 414s, but they're making it again. And with some, apparently some manufacturing that's making it more consistent or whatever. And so it's a very cool, for, for someone who likes vintage, um, old school microphone, analog microphones, that has a ton of appeal, but wait, there's more. Uh, it, uh, there's also like this digital component. So, so that kind of microphone has dual capsules so you can get a figure eight pattern. Again, to the layperson, I'm almost done. <laughs> we can talk about squash again. <laughs> but, so both of those capsules come out to the same XLR cable, right? So it's really just one signal, right? But these guys, and I think the Lewitt does too. So maybe this, you were just kind of read my mind. And then there's at least one other, the Townsend, does this too. There's a separate like mini XLR coming out. So you've got two back-to-back -back capsules, but you have two XLRs, so you can process them differently. And they have an app or a plug-in. And so you can, it's not manipulating the EQ, but you're manipulating the voltage. So you could record yourself, uh, you know, in a figure eight pattern, maybe turn the mic sideways. I don't, I can't really show you. Um, and then after the, after the fact, after it's already recorded, you can make it omni or cardioid or mid-side. Um, that's, so it's, it's, it's incredibly appealing to me that they've made this incredible analog uh, microphone using this, you know, unobtainable or, you know, very difficult to get capsule. And then, and then the kicker is, even though I probably wouldn't do a lot of this stuff, it's got all this kind of fun digital stuff that you could do too after the fact. Well, so that, that's my current obsession. I don't have one. This is all me laying awake at night on my laptop <laughs> to Lauren's horror, you know. Yeah, one inch, uh, one inch capsule. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that sounds really good. But otherwise, I'm, you know, I'm usually using these 414s and or the 451s. I love the AKG stuff. Um, I've got other mics. I've, I've ordered an a, a inexpensive ribbon mic. Um, recently so I just, heard a, I just heard um i heard i think it was maybe it was adam trom's om that he had done with a no it was lisa's lisa's guitar that she had recorded with an old rca ribbon holy cow it was it was explosive i mean it was just and again we'll go back to squash but when you get to hear that change you know, and when you can really hear that somebody has put this amount of work into it and they know what they're doing and yeah. all they're doing is just amplifying your experience, you know? Yeah. And they don't get a lot of pats on the backs for that. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, it's supposed to sound great. Well, <laughs> it's yeah. fun, you know, and, and, and it's not like I even have like a great room to record in or whatever. I just, you know, I just, this is my thing. I like to nerd out on it. And uh, someday I'll make a nice studio or something and really, you know, have some better preamps and take it to the next level. But for now, it's just something I like to play around with. And yeah, I'll have to hear that. Um, I know I've seen Lisa Lewitt posted some things like on social media and stuff where I think she was using a condenser. But so you're saying when, when she made the record, that was with an RCA ribbon. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to listen to that because I, I do like ribbon mics. I especially like them in combination with something else. Yeah, uh, she's, got, she's got two on it. And okay. um, I'm I'm not quite That's sure one. which one. It, it's one of the YouTube things, and you can see it. Mm. And I, it, when I was looking at it, I saw it. I saw I it like a, a seventy-seven or something like that, you know. And I just looked at it. And mm. went, oh, and listen to that. Yeah. Oh, boy. yeah. Well, the, that's, that's special. Well, the ribbons hear how we hear, and so a lot of times you feel like, wow, that's what that's what my guitar sounds like, and that's a really good thing. However. <laughs> When we actually listen to records, it's kind of like the difference between going to a movie and going to a play, right? I mean, we, we want exactly how we hear things, but a little bigger, you know, a little more hyped or whatever. And so that's where condenser mic microphones come in. It's sort of like, yeah, this is how you hear your guitar. And then here's some even more 
big and sheen and stuff. So um, yeah, lately I really like the idea, although I haven't done much of it, but of like having one ribbon and one condenser. So you can kind of get that, that extra HD kind of thing from the, from the condenser. But the ribbon really is just a very warm, uh, yeah, realistic beautiful. sound. Yeah. Beautiful sound. Mm -hmm. So, okay. You guys are definitely way beyond me and geekiness here, but, uh, <laughs> not when you do these very fancy recordings, what do you listen to them on? Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't listen on earbuds or anything like that. So I'm the guy who walks around. I don't, I can't find it, but I have some really nice big AKG headphones, open back headphones that that's how I walk around the neighborhood. I'm sure. And that's every day. And I'm almost always listening to an album. I try to listen to an album a day. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so I'm trying to listen on decent headphones. And then at home, I have a pair of um, Adam AX5. I think they are, I can't, I have my glasses on, but these are really nice monitors. Um, and then I have two home pods. Is that a thing? Is that what those things are called? Yeah, the, yeah. the Apple cells? Uh, I think those sound pretty good. I mean, they're obviously not really stereo or whatever, but for just casual listening, I'll listen to that. So it's either one of two very nice pair of headphones that I have, I think, and then or my nice monitors or the Apple home pods. Um, okay. I try not to listen to any. If you send me something to listen to, I promise not to listen to it on my laptop or anything like that, unless I'm plugged into it. I love good, I love great sound. I just, I've always loved albums. Um, now that I'm getting more into recording and stuff, I'm actually going back and listening to albums. And I just, I've never been more excited about music, to be honest, both making it, writing it and stuff, but also just really listening and appreciating it. Well, yeah, no, it's, it's it's a good thing to, to be able to hear things well. And I think that with the, the transition to digital and all these little tiny devices and, and everything else that we're, we're missing some of the real musicality of things. So, Oh, I remember I've told my son, you know, not too long ago that when I was his, when I was younger than him, I think actually when I was like 12 or 13, I was living in Pennsylvania, <clears throat> everyone had giant lawns and we had a rider mower. And that was my gig. I, I would ride to your house <laughs> and for 20 bucks, I'd mow your lawn. It would take like half a day because everyone had two acres, you know, and I saved up money. And then my dad, who did not, you know, we ne did not have money when I was a kid. So, he, you know, he, it wasn't like this was easy for him, but he matched me. And uh, so I don't remember how, it was, how much it was, but it might have been something like eight or nine hundred dollars, which is just, you know, in 1972 or something. Um, it was just a ton of money. I went and bought a Fisher stereo with big giant speakers and a turntable. And, but you know, all my friends had stuff like that too. And you'd go over to each other's house and I mean, you know, but <laughs> explaining it to a, uh, you know, a 16 year old now, and you would just like put on an album and it was like getting into a hot tub I and mean, you could just swim around in it. And it just it was amazing. And then when it was over, you'd, you know, you'd go back to the beginning cause you didn't have a whole bunch of other albums. This is what you're listening to this week. And um, yeah. So, which just goes back to something I said earlier. It's like, I'm really going back to listen, trying to listen to a whole album um, on my morning walk or during yoga, or just at some point, like listen to a whole album. Cause I, I just, I love that experience. And it's, it's like, if you've been reading on your iPad for the last three years and you suddenly get a really good book and you get a whiff of it and you, and you know, it's not going to tell you you've got an alert or some bullshit like that. You're just going to be completely absorbed in it. And you remember, you're like, yeah, books. Oh man. Um, yeah, I love albums. Yeah, no, is, the, the idea of the album as a, a, a complete uh, story as opposed to a series of short stories. Um, yeah. It's a very different approach to, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather die than listen to like Pandora where it's gonna just give you what it thinks you wanna hear in a, you know, low grade mp3 rant you know i just yeah. yeah no thanks so i think that there'll be some surprises in this question but uh oh top uh -oh. five top five records and when you when you did you you did it with me mm -hmm. um at one point and you started to play beggar's banquet mm. and I remember what a what a response you had for that. That was that was. Uh, yeah, I, this is always a tough one. I've I've been asked this kind of thing before. Um, 
Yeah. This reminds me, have you guys watched the movie High Fidelity recently? It's such a great movie. Because <laughs> everything's top five this, top five that. It's so much fun. And it really depends on what time of day. And, and there's so many categories. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know really know where to start. I, I'll tell you five. I'll get, how about this? I'll give you five things I'm listening to right now. Great. Perfect. And I'm really into. Perfect. Um, I'm going to mispronounce some names or probably not even remember them. But you guys can, anybody out there can email me if you're at all curious. Um, I love duo Ooh. albums. Um, I often thought if I still started my own record company, it would be called Duo Records. I've made some duo records. Um, I have a real um, soft spot for two musicians interacting. And to that end, um, I have this record that I got about a year and a half ago from two uh, young women on the East Coast, uh, one's from Scotland, one's from New York, and, and her name is Jenna Moynihan, and the other one's name is Mari Shambell, I think, or Shambell. I don't know if I'm saying that right, she's from Scotland, and it's Scottish uh, fiddle and harp, and it is um, the most incredibly interactive, conversational, beautiful um, album that's just full of um, poignant moments that just, yeah, really cut to the heart of the matter of, of life and mm -hmm. uh, just, just stunning music. It's, I think it's a lot of, I, I've, been, I've been wanting to sort of reach out <laughs> to one of them and kind of, kind of understand more about it because I don't always know what I'm listening to and I'm listening to, 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 to that music and, and I don't play harp. I do know a lot about the fiddle, although I don't play fiddle. But that album, um, and I believe that there's, there's a mixture of, of uh, old, very old music and, and, and original things. Um, but the playing and the tone and, and the recording uh, is just stunning. And that album is called One Two. And you can find that on you know, the, the Spotify or the, the Apple Music and stuff like that. And, and you can certainly buy it. It'll sound even better and, and, and help out to young people uh, or young to me anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that are doing uh, incredible music. In fact, there's a whole thing happening in New England and some surrounding area and into, you know, the UK and Canada that seems to be centered around Daryl Anger's uh, roots music department in um, Berkeley School of Music. There's just so many young musicians coming out of there, out of there making incredible art right now so that's that's a that's an area i've been swimming pretty deep in but that album there's another album i just listened to man i can't remember this one it's louise oh man oh maybe i can find it um well and we will we will have full information on the uh players forum website uh possibly tacked on to the end of the podcast here but um yeah. definitely on the player forum website well here's an album called out of my own light the margaret tate project by a young woman named, I can't read it from here, Louise Bachman, maybe? This album I got turned on to recently, uh, another Scottish uh, fiddler. And this woman, I think when she was 25, which is, I think recently, I think it was last year, she, I'm not remembering this right, so you guys can look it up, but I'll just try to quickly remember it a little bit. But it's this kind of story that really gets me. It's a concept album, which is another thing I like. Um, she, I think her grandmother passed away and they, there were some diaries found. And when, when she was 25 years old, her grandmother that is, uh, had two different men propose to her and she was very conflicted. And she flew from Orkney Islands, Scotland, over to meet some families in, in Canada, uh, some family in Canada, you know, in 1946, I think it was, and just had to go there and, and sort it all out. And she herself was a singer and somehow ended up on this, the CBC singing. And so this young woman, current day, you know, reads all these diaries and actually finds those recordings and builds this whole concept album that's just beautiful. It's all instrumental, a little bit of vocal where um, there's a lot of um, um, ostinato type, like kind, of, kind of like a movie soundtrack where themes kind of come and go throughout the whole album. And, and then there's some of that embedded actual recordings from 1946. Mm. Um, but you know, it's one of the things yeah, I, I'll listen to over and over again. It's just, it's just so, so beautiful. And then last but not least, there's this other one, as far as young Scottish fiddlers <laughs> go. Uh, see, it's, it's up here on my desktop, I think. Uh, what is her name? Lauren McCall, I think it is. There's a, a record called Lans, Lanstein, Lanskeen, um, 
again, you can get in, get in touch with me. And that's really beautiful too. I think that was recorded in like an old church or something like that. And it's just solo fiddle, but with a little bit of um, acoustic piano and some drones. I think there was, she even said something about an electric guitar that was just kind of like the amp was just left humming in the back. So some drones, but that's a stunning, uh, they're old Scottish airs. And um, it's, that's an incredible record too that I've been really digging into. And those are all new by really young people making really, wow. in my opinion, really important music. Well, it's not like electric guitars or dance music, but um, you know, so that's a thing. And then um, there's this Losil, Losal, uh, I wish Goldenberger's here, he can say it. I think it's a French, um, I, sometimes I'll listen to um, um, some ambient um, electronic music. <laughs> and so this is a guy that I really like and he has this album called Plume. Um, but if you find that, you'll find like his other records and I really like that too. Um, you know, sometimes it, it, it can kind of, you might have like a five or six minute piece that really just kind of sounds like an air conditioner that's been left on or something. But I mean, it's pretty, pretty ambient. <laughs> you got to be in the right space for it. But I really, I really like that a lot. Um, you know, and then once in a while, Lauren and I, we were doing some driving last month and we were like listening to some um, classic stuff that always makes me super excited. I love the physical graffiti record, the Led Zeppelin record. I just, that one will always just erase the world and time and everything to me, just completely go in the sunken place with that one. Um, trying to think what else. Yeah, we, we, and we were listening to um, uh, Jessica <laughs> the other day, really, really loud. Um, uh, the Almond Brothers, <laughs> you know, from the Brothers and Sisters record. If you haven't listened to that while in a while, that that piano solo on there is just just bubbling, you know, it just bubbles over. And then I think we might have been talking about Mark and him playing with Peter Frampton, and and I'm like, you know, yeah, we haven't listened to Frampton Comes Alive in a long time, so we we're driving. Uh, we got kind of a newer car, so we have this new stereo, so we've been kind of into that and going for drives and listening to stuff real loud. So we listened to. Do you feel like we do really loud for the first time in a really long time? And that that really kind of got me going. Um, I don't really listen to too many jazz records, like I was saying, um, but there is a, and I was to contradict what I said earlier about not listening to a lot of jazz guitar. There is a sort of a newish West Montgomery record, um, the ORTF session. I think it was released maybe four or five years ago. It's a live record. That's the best West Montgomery record I've heard in a while. And that's the closest I've come to, kind of getting back into playing more jazz, just listening to that record. Huh. Um, so there's, there's five random things, but things that, that I am listening to, I, like I said, I've been more into recording and production. And so I go down YouTube rabbit holes of like listening to interviews with famous mixers. And sometimes they'll get that question, like top five, you know, game changing mixing album, you know, albums from the mix perspective from the 90s go, you know, and then whatever I, they say, I write down and I go listen to some, listening to a lot of like um, 90s hip hop, um, uh, the Missy Elliott, um, Super Dupa Fly um, is something I might not otherwise listen to, but oh my God, it sounds incredible. And uh, there was some no doubt, there was some like, um, what, uh, Tears for Fear, you know, just like some of these albums, I wasn't really into them at the time, but now that I'm kind of listening more from a production perspective, like they're incredible, you know, just, yeah. So there's a lot of random stuff. I'm done with him, Tad. What about you? <laughs> I, you know, I'm just having so much fun listening. I mean, I, I hope I so. I feel like I'm, yeah. We could go on for another hour or two. I wouldn't complain. So. <laughs> Uh, I think, yeah, I, and actually Lauren is doing a, um, you know, my wife is a, is a teacher and she's teaching, um, you know, from a distance, of course, like, like, as we all know, and, and f missing that connection with the kids. So every once in a while they'll do something. Well, this time they're doing the Halloween parade. So that means the kids stay where they are. They're, some of them be at the school, some, some of them we have the addresses or whatever, but I'm going to go drive at three, I'm going to go drive Lauren around. So she's going to be kind of like, you know, waving like, uh, you know, like in the back of a float, right? We're going to go drive around the neighborhood to, to actually see all our kids. And it, it's, it's real, it's, it's sort of heartbreaking, you know, um, 
but it's also really wonderful. So uh, yeah, that is really wonderful. That's, that's, that's yeah. Great. We they did a they did a crazy thing here yesterday with drive through trick or treating down. Oh wow! Yeah, down on all of the pullouts by the water. So you know, if there's a place where people pull out and get out and get get, get go down to the beach and stuff like that. So there's about six or seven of them, and I just took a drive past it. And, you know, there were people out there in monster outfits, and, you know, like giant 10 foot monster outfits. And they were just going absolutely crazy. And the kids were having the best time. It was, they were just, you know, got it. It was like, and we can figure this thing out. You know, we don't have to have thousand people parties. We can figure out how to be creative. It's so. Yeah, just seeing each other. I mean, it's nice to, you know, the screen is nice, but to, I think that just the driving by the way, like I have friends now that we uh, go for walks, you know, a few feet apart or whatever, it, you know, and um, yeah, now more than ever, we need that, right? Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you so much, Eric. Oh, That's yeah. It. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And um, we'll, uh, I'm sure, surprise a few people when this goes up and um, we'll get it up for you pretty quickly. So. All right. Well, and, and I am really looking forward to when we can all get out and about. We'd love to have you back down in the Bay Area uh, oh. and play again, Eric. Oh, so. Thank you. You're yeah. so, so generous. I or maybe come it. down to the beach and record another album. I know. I, got, <laughs> I you know, I'd be, I, I'd be happy to go anywhere right now. And that, that sounds particularly amazing. You know, like, a, God. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it just it's, feels so stuck. But. It's pretty, it's pretty weird to, it's Somebody, pretty weird. It's pretty weird. So yeah. thank you very much. Uh, Have a wonderful afternoon, buddy. All right. See yeah. you soon. You bet. Be Bye, well. guys. Fantastic. Bye-bye. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed this installment of the Santa Cruz Coffee Break. For more music-related fun, please join the Santa Cruz Guitar Players Forum at scgcpf or santacruzguitarplayers.com. If you have any questions or possible podcast topics, please contact us. If you have a product or service that you feel would be of value to our listeners, please consider adding your support and keeping the coffee pot on. Contact us for more information. We ask that you hit the like, follow, bell, or bookmark buttons so we can keep you informed of upcoming podcast episodes. We hope you enjoyed Santa Cruz Coffee Break. Now it's time to go play your guitar. <laughs>